okay. And it's kind of weird. Zoom, if you don't start talking, it doesn't start recording it. So I just, it's like a five blah, blah, second blah. delay or something. So I'll just edit it out. So, all right, kids, uh, we are back again. And we have a very special guest, uh, Mr. John Malecki coming up, coming up. Let me try this again. Take two. Hey, everybody, this is Jake. And no, I'm not Jake. Just this is for the class. Hey, everybody. We got another special guest today. We have a very special guest. We have John Lucky coming all the way to us from Pittsburgh. Um, he's joining us. Uh, and I've been following John on the social medias, I think, since he started way back when, uh, just doing stuff from uh, reclaimed lumber and welding stuff. And now he's, he's big time. Um, can I just, I'm doing a, I'm doing a Donnie Carter here. And you can guys look up Donnie Carter later, but uh, currently he has 232,000 subscribers on YouTube and 178,000 on Instagram. My last check here. So, uh, and he's been, he's just doing a really good job. So he's joining us today for class and we're going to be asking him some similar questions. And so uh, we're going to start off with uh, just tell us uh, what you, what do you do? What do you do for a living? So, um, one, thank you guys so much for taking the time to uh, be forced into watching me. Um, I, and I appreciate all those kind words. I, uh, I, I, it's, uh, it's always nice to be able to uh, be able to chat with someone new. We've never got to meet in person, yeah. uh, Jacob. So this is, this is phenomenal. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so a little bit about myself. I, uh, my name is John Malecki, as it was stated earlier. Um, and I am a, I guess you could call it a maker uh, based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, <clears throat> with a background in uh, football, ironically. So uh, I grew up here in Pittsburgh. Um, I went to the University of P Pittsburgh where I played football for, uh, for four years and, and graduated with a degree in marketing. And then I bounced around the NFL for about four years after that, where I picked up the hobby of woodworking um, in, my, in the off season. A lot of people don't know that in the NFL off season, you have an incredible amount of downtime really? when, you're not, when you're not training. Um, and you can only train for so many hours a day. And when you don't have a family, you're pretty much to your own. So you can either get in a ton of trouble or find some stuff to do. Yeah. Um, and I picked up the hobby of woodworking. Uh, but my last year in the NFL, so that'd be 2012, 13-ish, uh, around there. And I was just making stuff for myself. And in the house, uh, uh, actually, my roommate at the time broke a coffee table. Uh, so I went and found a plan, uh, rebuilt one based on something I, I had seen that I liked from a friend. And uh, fortunately, I grew up handy around tools with a, with a dad who, and grandfather who were in construction. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I was a very substantially large child, I was the most free uh, and capable labor they could find. So I was always having to help them do stuff. Um, and from there, I developed that hobby into becoming a sort of an income stream. Uh, to where I started posting on Facebook and getting inquiries to build stuff for people. Uh, when I got released from the Steelers in my last season, I uh, I just basically took a year off to to sort of figure out you know, what, what what I wanted to do with my life, uh, and I just kept building stuff in my buddy's garage and in, in the in this in my free time. And uh, uh, when it came down to having to actually pay some bills, I uh, took the chance of like just establishing an LLC and started selling my, my woodworking, I get, you could call them woodworking products, um, some wouldn't, and, uh, that, and, I, and I kind of just started chasing that uh, from there. A couple years into it, I, I jumped on the social uh, a little bit deeper with Instagram and started using that to promote my business to where uh, that was supplementing a lot of the income I had coming in uh, as far as awareness and inquiries, uh, and I was using it as like a portfolio. I was using it as behind the scenes, and I actually have a podcast called Made for Profit uh, with another maker in our community, Brad Rodriguez. Um, and I, you know, I've gone through it hundreds of times on there. Like that part of the story, if you're if you're interested in a little bit deeper dive, check that out. Um, but from there, I was using Instagram to grow my business, and I started and and I started on YouTube because of a friend. I uh, thought it would be a good idea to to do the same kind of thing. He thought I'd enjoy it. And he was like, you can make a couple bucks doing so. Um, I will say, selfishly say that my intent on growing a social following was to get the awareness of brands and to get free tools in order to supplement my woodworking business. Uh, I wanted to be able to increase my you know tools without having to spend the actual money on them. And so I started to, to wade the waters of becoming an influencer as my social following started to grow. 
Um, and then about two, two years ago, I, I stepped away from doing custom commission work full time to doing uh, full time content creation um, as far as business goes. So now I have a full time videographer, photographer that's in the shop with me, an editor, uh, a copywriter, website manager. And I also have a podcast um, that we run. Uh, that's kind of in like a little bit of a limbo phase right now, but we've been doing that podcast for about two and a half, three years. Yep. And uh, so that as far as who I am and what I do, uh, I'm a YouTuber with a podcast, which seems to be quite popular thing to stay today's day and age. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I'm a big uh, fan of made for profit. I've been listening to it for a long time. So any of you who have not heard of made for profit, it's a, uh, it's very well done as far as what do you need to do if you want to be an influencer, if you want to be a maker, if you want to do all this stuff and uh, how are you going to be profitable at it and what do you need to look at where you need to be aware of. And so I've learned a lot from it personally, for sure. Nice. Awesome. And uh, I'm just, and I was, I'm glad it's back because you guys took a little, took a little break here, but uh, the last one, I want to talk about the last one in a little bit. Hmm. Um, you know, just kind of what the times were in, but uh, yeah. What, can you, and you just kind of, you know, you went through real quick kind of evolution of your business. What, where did you, you know, I know you said it started with a coffee table. And I remember the first thing I saw that you really made that really stood out to me was, uh, I don't even know what to call it. Cause it's not, I mean, it was a huge piece that was a bridge that was metal and wood. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the thing that made me go, wow, this is, that, that was like, something else. That was a bar top. So yeah. th it was just, I got super lucky. So the one yeah. benefit of Pittsburgh is like, it's a big, small city, right? Right, right. Um, and that it has a, a wide array of business types and, um, but it's small enough that like you can know someone through two people. Um, sure. So yeah. with that, I was, I was fortunate that from go, going to Pitt and playing for the Steelers, I was picking up a lot of inquiries from, from people who are willing to take a chance on myself and um, West Elm has what's called their workspace line and they were uh, launching their showroom in Pittsburgh. One of the managers of the showroom uh, happened to be a follower of mine on Instagram. Uh, one of the benefits of having a social following and two yeah. was also a Steeler fan. So yeah. uh, they reached out and were looking for a unique custom piece for the showroom okay. to fit as a standing bar. So it wasn't a product that they carried because they carry office equipment and furniture in that right. workspace line. Um, so we commissioned and I, and I was super into and still am into the, um, the live edge slab kind of furniture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and I, I uh, was learning to weld at the time and uh, a really good friend of mine who, who, who recently passed away um, and I got together and we started brainstorming on conceptually how we could embody the style that they were looking for. Keep it clean, keep it modern and emulate the, the fact it was in, in Pittsburgh specifically. Yeah. Um, if you've ever been to Pittsburgh, there's hundreds of bridges um, there, and, and there's three rivers that kind of come to a point in the center of the city. Um, so we're very well known for the industrial vibe and aspect of our, of our architecture and the industrial-esque design elements that are throughout any of the older buildings in Pittsburgh. So this building is yeah. downtown. Um, you know, right in the center, in the heart of all of that kind of stuff. Mm. And uh, so we came up with this bridge design and I uh, kind of just, I, I drew it up in SketchUp. I pitched it mm. to them Yeah, and it ended up being a really awesome piece. I mean, it's still there. Yeah. Um, I still get invited back twice a year for a couple of their parties and stuff. And I've done a few more. I did a, this massive barn door for them as well. Wow. Um, and a few, a few smaller, smaller items in there when I was still doing custom commission stuff. And um, mm. That piece kind of was one of those items that I, I looked at from a business standpoint and was like, this is, this is a lot of fun. Like mm -hmm. one, no one's real. There's a, there's a couple guys, two guys in Pittsburgh at, at the time. Um, one was doing super modern, uh, like uh, mid-century style furniture and the other guys are doing just slabs, yeah. but no metal. So I was like, hmm, I like metal. I like slabs. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, between that and industrial, excuse me, and the uh, reclaimed wood at the time, like the, yeah. that slab and metal and, mm -hmm. and dust and reclaimed wood and metal was kind of my vibe and look. So that was yeah. a really cool project. And ironically, I just, <laughs> uh, we were shooting a video last week for two weeks from now. So I don't know when yeah. this is, okay. when you're sending this out, but we're doing some tips on uh, working with epoxy and resin because mm -hmm. it's something I'm, I'm semi known for. And, um, that project specifically, I, I was the first time I'd ever used resin in okay. anything because it. I bought this slab on eBay, yeah, 
and it had a massive void in it. And I went to fill it and I used yeah. the complete wrong product and ended up costing me a ton of money. I had to chisel it all out and report. Yeah. And I talked about that experience, like, I don't know, four days ago when we were filming. So it's super yeah. funny you bring that project mm -hmm. up. Well, and it's funny because we're doing work since we can't be in class right now, we're even just going over, you know, how to use hand tools and I wish we could practice, but you know, what are different types of chisels and how do you sharpen <clears> chisels? <throat> I'm not, we'll, we'll, we'll let them just take a look at your uh, latest chisel video. Um, yeah. <laughs> and a little bit of watch that today. That was, that was pretty good. I like that. That, was, that, that chisel will give you a, it'll, it'll make you a, uh, it'll make you an honest man <laughs> for sure. <laughs> it was good. I liked it. Um, and, and you've touched on this a little bit. Um, so how, you know, what, what the parts that you enjoy, what are, what are some of the, the, maybe the highlights of what, what you really enjoy about like what you do as far as maker and being a content creator. And um, I mean, cause you're, you're doing stuff out of slabs, you're teaching classes, you're creating content, you're, I mean, you, you kind of got your, your hands and fingers and all kinds of things, but what are some of the things that you really kind of keep you going and really enjoy about what you do? Well, I think the people is probably the, the thing I love the most about um, mm -hmm. being this micro influencer or being right. able to participate in the maker community yeah. um, because you get to, like, I, I come from a background in sports, like, like mm -hmm. I said earlier, and I like am, am very drawn to, and I very much like to be in a community or on a team mm -hmm. specifically. And, and it's, um, I was, a, I was an offensive lineman for those of you that were curious. Um, so like um, that, that kind of environment and where you're, you're, you're able to perfect and work on your own tangible skill set, but be able mm -hmm. to apply them to the benefit of the the mass or the benefit of the team. Right. Um, I, I that, that's one of the aspects I miss a lot from sports, mm -hmm. but that I feel like the maker community specifically has. So, yeah. um, being able to put out content that's inspiring, or then I'm able to give some tips or insights to help people build better stuff for themselves and, and, and be able to kind of build relationships around the experiences that we've had together um, in, in making that kind of stuff is something that I, that I absolutely love. Um, and the same thing goes for if I'm teaching a class, um, you know, it's, it's the same uh, feeling at the end when <clears throat> I'm able to help someone bring something to life they didn't know they were actually capable of. Yeah. Um, same yeah. thing, you know, I'm, I'm getting a lot of DMs uh, and, and emails right now from people who are trying their first like river table, for instance, mm -hmm. um, yeah. because they have the time yeah. and they're in their basement, they've got, it's poured and they're, I'm getting photos of, of the molds and, and epoxy types and all kinds of stuff. And I'm yeah. my kid and, and, it, and it feels great to be able to help those individuals. Right. Um, because I was able to learn a lot of that stuff on somebody else's dime because I was doing custom work. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I was able to test it and I had a little bit of experience, but one thing I talk about, I made for profit is that if you want to try something and you can find the right client, you can get them to pay for you to try and then yeah. circumvent that learning curve of you having to pay for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, in, in, in enjoying what we do as the, a community, that's one of the things that I, I absolutely love the most. Um, and that goes, and that also goes for the like experiences I'm capable of having with, with custom clients is, mm -hmm. is bringing their kind of vision to life, um, in a physical form. It's, it's just as amazing, um, in that sort of a transactional aspect as it is in a relation, in a relationship, uh, building right. sort of situation, which would be between two friends or two acquaintances or two people on social, um, someone learning from you or me, we were just talking uh, about, you know, George Von Triska before we, yeah. before we started recording and. George allows me to just ask him questions nonstop and uh, being able to have those sort of relationships is one of the most enjoyable. Um, and one of the, one of the, my favorite aspects of being a part of um, the, the maker community and being able to, to kind of do what I do on a daily basis. Right. Right. Awesome. Um, and the kind of the question that follows it, what are, what have been some of the challenges that uh, you've had to kind of work through, you know, over the past three, four or five years you've been doing this? Um, there's the obvious challenges of being a business for yourself and one that's always being able to uh, sustain, uh, you know, paying the bills, um, mm -hmm. being able to, to, uh, you know, manage income and, and, and outgoing and, and balance all of the, the, uh, standard aspects of any sort of business, uh, right. from, from management to customer acquisition to, to, you know, building out projects, delivery and all that. Mm -hmm. Those are, those are all standard kind of bumps and yeah. humps. Uh, within anything. One of the, 
one of the more difficult, you know, sides of where I'm at is uh, I'm constantly dealing with like being, being almost torn down the center, right? Like uh, being a content creator, it's, it's interesting because for myself, for instance, um, you know, the, the, what I'm known for and what I love to do are mm-hmm. two different things to, really? to some extent. Okay. Um, and like uh, creating content is based around content performance. Yeah. So if you put out content and you want to be a successful content creator, you have to be able to capitalize on um, what's working for you at the time. It's right. like if you're selling, if you're selling cabinets um, and, and you want to be selling tables, you got to stop selling cabinets. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and content's the same thing. And for a long time, I really tried to just do what I really felt in my heart that I wanted to do instead of look at the data and analytics, um, digest it, and be able to regurgitate um, content based on what my audience was wanting to see. Right. Uh, it's been something I've always struggled with because because I want to try, you know, <laughs> yeah, I want to try uh, building a a gas a gas tank for a motorcycle from scratch. I want to try uh, building a, a cantilever deck off of my house. Like mm-hmm. a lot of these things, I am very intrigued in, into learning how to do, but my content audience isn't specifically looking for that. Mm-hmm. And, and what's funny is like on, a, on an individual basis, I can, we could talk and I could, and you'd probably watch that piece of the content regardless. Yeah. But when it comes to being a performer on a platform like YouTube, for instance, mm-hmm. um, it just doesn't work that simply. So for myself, you know, the river tables and those big kind of epic slab furniture pieces have been what I've been known for for a few years. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've done some cooler, smaller projects, but I always tried to stay away from just 100% going hard at like making the craziest resin and in, in live edge furniture possible yeah. until like literally two months ago when I was looking at my numbers and I was like, I'm just, I'm just treading water mm-hmm. to an extent with my content strategy. Like the business right. is good. Right. My, like, like my audience is, is a phenomenal group of individuals and people who are coming together and like really bind around my messaging and what I'm trying to do as far as make things approachable, entertaining right. and, uh, and exciting. And, the platform YouTube itself just doesn't care about my feelings. So right. like it's a hard, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. <clears throat> it's a hard balance when you're in it. And that, and, then, and what's funny is this is like core business principle. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if you, you, you have to be able to analyze what's working and what's not and cut right. the fat. Right. And if you really want to grow and be successful, you have to be able to look at what's working and, and, and gear your stuff towards that direction. And I, it's, I talk, well, I'm, I'm much better at doing it selling products than I am doing content. Because I look at content as like me personally wanting to try something and then sharing that with people, but I didn't build my content that way. So like mm-hmm. I was very confused when I got into making mm-hmm. content early and it's kind of hindered me to this point. So going back to your question, one of the biggest struggles I've had up to this point was actually like figuring out like what I'm about as a brand, mm-hmm. as far as a content creator and like you've in, in and realizing how I want that to be portrayed on the internet. Like, mm-hmm. cause, yeah. cause you could say and do all this stuff behind the scenes and none of it actually matters until you, you, mm-hmm. you put it up and yeah. put it out there. Um, right. And when I'm walking into shows and stuff and I get to meet all these ph- phenomenal, amazing people and they're all asking me about mm-hmm. <laughs> the black yeah. rifle table right. and the, in the, in the river table, you're like, mm-hmm. no one really cares that I can hand cut dovetails that's in my audience or no one else really really is looking that deep into the metallurgy that goes into mm, actually yeah. learning how to TIG weld properly. Mm. So it's like, and so I've, I've had this sort of like eye opening and, and sort of a, I don't know, tearing apart of the seams of my core kind of experience where I'm like, you know, I, I love teaching, but my content audience isn't always looking for that. If I can inspire someone to pick up a welder or I can inspire someone to uh, try an epoxy project, it's, mm-hmm. I'm getting the same result that I was looking for that I don't have to specifically teach them the details of that situation mm-hmm. all the time. I right. can give them tips and tricks to get better and still make the content that I kind of want to. Right. And so that's always been a weird balance and like something that I've been really not good at. And that's been really hard for me. And if you go back and listen to like episode, I don't know, eight, I want to guess, wild guess. I've yeah. made for profit from 2017, I believe. Yep. Um, I, th- I think I say like I completely avoided trying to be the river table guy for a long time when I had a river table that was doing great. And it's right. still right. like the second yeah. best piece of content I've ever made yeah. and performance wise, as far as what people are watching on my channel. So 
that's been a struggle for me to not be that guy and then realize that you're that guy. (laughs) And then, and then, but, but I'm looking at it now as like a positive thing. It's like, all right, if that's how people see me and that's how my audience, that's the content my audience wants to see. I'm going to go all in on becoming the most, um, excuse me, becoming the best influence for that type of content that I possibly can. Um, and then showing and educating and inspiring and doing it and making it as approachable as possible. Cause, um, because because that's a uh, that's what the data is telling me it's not so much what my heart's telling me and and if you're ever going to get into business and especially if you want to do woodworking as a business you'll learn a couple things one early you're going to do whatever comes in the door Mm -hmm. you got to put your feelings and emotions aside and you got to pay the bills Mm -hmm. um but you have to over time learn to steer things in the direction you want to go um and so that if in whether that's artistically or financially you're going to find the, the direction that you feel one happiest and most comfortable with. Um, and then the business will become something different in that evolution. Uh, and, and, and that's the same thing that goes for content creation as well. You might start out thinking you want to be the next Jimmy DeResta. Yeah. And you'll realize very, very quickly, you're not as cool, interesting, or talented as he is. <laughs> so you better make, make your, make something different happen right, quick. Right. Um, yeah. And, and, and that, that's been, I would say the most difficult aspect of my business evolution from football to custom furniture, to content creation, to okay. where I'm at now, trying to take it to the next level. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. Cause you, you know, it's, and this is what I love that we get to talk about this kind of stuff because, um, you know, some kids will all say I've got a YouTube channel and they, they freak out cause I've got you know, a little over a thousand followers. I'm almost, almost to 2000. Maybe. I don't know. Nice. But it's like, how do I do that? It's like, well, you, you got to just start, you got to start putting yourself out there and doing this, but you do, you get rich off of this. I mean, there's so many questions that some kids have and I'm no, you no, know, you can't, but it, that's, I think that's the way you get, get yourself going for sure. Um, you can get rich off anything. You can get rich off digging ditches just as easily as you can get rich off being a YouTuber. Like don't get, don't get it twisted. It's not easy. Oh yeah. Oh no, it's not easy. But I think, you know, what's that just our society of, yeah, that's, I mean, that's where the attention is. I think for a lot, especially a lot of, well, for anybody actually, not just young, Yeah. especially young. Absolutely. But uh, I thought, you know, even just the time we're in right now with uh, the virus going on, Mm -hmm. And uh, I just was listening to your last episode of Made for Profit. And what really hit me um, was, you know, we're just talking about what's going on and, and makers in general and what's going on with them and what should you be doing right now. And you told a story about, you know, just really grinding and hustling. And you were to even talking about, well, when you got uh, got the call to, to come to the Steelers. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that, that really, that was really good. Uh, can you just touch, give, give a quick, yeah, just quick, quick summary of what you said there. I don't want, you know, repeat the whole thing, but I yeah, thought so, that was, that was so excellent. Brad and I were talking on the show about, um, sort of like adapting to the times. Right. Yeah. Um, and one thing that I'm a, I'm a huge advocate and fan of in any context is becoming the most valuable person you can be to that situation Mm -hmm. um and 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 reflecting back to like um to my football days so uh, i'll bring it back to relating to right now but when i got called up to the steelers training camp um it was literally just happenstance and i got lucky um and that's a lot of what happens in sports for for a lot of people um but i was playing for the buccaneers i was under contract it was the lockout year we're going from my rookie year Mm -hmm. to my second, my sophomore season. And um, <clears throat> the lockout meant that there was no off season team activities. So you didn't have OTAs. There wasn't any when, excuse me, spring or summer training. Okay. Um, you just showed up for training camp. Uh, and then they were negotiating the collective bargaining agreement and uh, you weren't able to actually practice, but everyone was kind of showing up. So I show up for day one, unpack my stuff. I'm under contract. I head in the facility um, we go to our first meeting. I walk out of the meeting. I'm going to my locker and I get cut. And I'm literally like, what? what? Like we literally just had that. Like, Hey guys, good to see you. You look fat. Like you look great. We're having our conditioning tests in, in, in an hour. Um, go get dressed kind of meeting. Right. It wasn't anything like besides that. Um, and I get released and there were some coaching changes and whatnot. Um, for whatever reason, I'm on a plane. Yeah. I'm back in Pittsburgh and this was the sixth or seventh time I'd had been cut. 
mm. from a year before. So like I was bouncing around all over the place and that's a whole different story. Yeah. But I'm, uh, I'm sitting on my parents' couch and my agent calls me and he's like, uh, he's like, Hey, um, how fast can you be in La Trobe? And I was like, eh, about 15, 20 minutes. And he's like, all right, the Steelers just had a guy literally walk off the field um, and quit. Uh, get, get your ass up there. And I was like, excuse my language. I was like, yes, sir. Like I didn't even, I don't even think I packed a bag. Um, right. But I lived so close yeah. that I was able to facilitate a need immediately. So I drive up there. Um, fortunately, my agent represented James Harrison. So he had close relations with the Steelers. Mm -hmm. um, I buzz in there. I'm sitting there. They're, they just needed a warm body to fill right. a spot. Like they didn't really care that moment because it was, uh, everything was about to sign the collective bargaining agreement, like get rolling. Um, and I get in there and, and one of the things that, uh, Tomlin said early in, in one of the team meetings was that like, you better, like if you're, unless you're, <laughs> unless you're big Ben, you better be making yourself as valuable to this team as possible. Something in a roundabout way, mm -hmm. uh, to that context. So I looked at that and I was like, you know what, I'm going to go on, I'm going to go on punt team. I'm going to be on kickoff. I'm going to learn a long snap, short snap. I'm going to do literally everything I can to make sure that you cannot get rid of me because I'm too valuable to you. Right. Um, and in that, in that like kind of moment of, of, or I guess in that process of learning all of those things and, and being able to stick around that team for a couple of years, um, you really do get to realize that the more valuable you can make yourself in any situation, the better off you're going to be in the long term, regardless. Mm -hmm. um, so after learning all these kind of skills to make sure that, you know, when the guy showed up next to me, he might be a better center, but he can't play guard. He can't play, right. he can't be on punt. He can't long snap. He can't, I got all these other skills that, you know, even if I'm not as good at this one thing, they're kind of making me more valuable in these other things. I brought that mindset to right. my furniture and my, and my kind of experience as a, as a business owner and a maker. It's like uh, the more you can do, uh, kind of, and that's what Tomlin used to call it. It's like the more you can do. Uh, and so putting the time and effort in to learn more stuff was, it, it was where my brain uh, started to kind of um, grow from football and bring it to woodworking and furniture. Right. And so <clears throat> that's everything in all aspects of it, <laughs> unfortunately. And it becomes like the Superman situation to an extent. But I've always looked at it as like, if, if I can have this skill, at least I know what's going on mm -hmm. if I ever have to offload it. So whether that's learning how to build a website, learning how to write, learning how to podcast, learning how to edit video, learning how to shoot video, learning how to photograph, learning how to actually do the building stuff, mm -hmm. whatever those skills were, I took that mindset that I learned in football when I was the least valuable guy on the team and learned how to stick around and applied it to business in my life. And in, and in hard times like this, um, what we talked about on the show was, I kind of go and revert back to that uh, kind of mindset. It's like uh, when, when you have to buckle down and really like face the music, what you have to realize is that you're not the, you're not the best, you're not the biggest. Um, and, and there's always going to be someone that's trying to take your job um, in any sort of situation yes. and whatever that might look like, how valuable can you be? Um, so in, in where we are as makers, for instance, like this is a phenomenal time to learn a new skill like yeah. welding or like turning or like anything that you could take from where you're at to help you become better and where you want to go. Um, and that skill set might feel like it's something that you would never use, but the minute or second that you do, or there's an opportunity that presents itself, uh, you, you can really grow from it. And, and I know specifically in these hard times that like there's lots of companies looking for welders right now, even in what's, what's going on in the economy, what's going on uh, globally. I've seen multiple, multiple, offers uh, looking for uh, semi-experienced to experienced welders yeah. for very well-paying jobs. Um, and one in not, there's not only is there a shortage of, you know, the skilled trades and that's a whole other conversation, but right. for you to be able to go from say making cutting boards um, and selling those as a side hustle to <clears throat> learning how to do some sort of like a traditional hand cut joinery in, in your woodworking or Japanese joinery or from, for me, for instance, turning, uh, something that I'm, I'm learning as we go through this stuff. Um, that brings just a, maybe another twist or element or something that you can bring uh, to the table long term for your, your brand or your business or whatever you're trying to do. So uh, in, in, in any sort of hard situation, I tend to 
kind of internalize what's going on and say, am I as good as I could possibly be? And am I doing everything to make sure that I'm going to make it out of this? Okay. Or that because I'm a, I'm a believer of, uh, of, of like the, the mindset and the practice of extreme ownership. Uh, and that's a book by uh, Jocko Willink. He's a okay. phenomenal um, ex-military mind who has an incredible um, mindset when it comes to mental toughness and business and, and, and all kinds of stuff. So anyway, in that, <clears throat> and you should be able to look at any situation and be able to internalize it and, and see uh, what did I do wrong in this and how can I be better for the right. next opportunity. And I, I, look at, I look at a global recession the same way. <laughs> like, uh, from, I mean, I'm breaking down all my sponsorship opportunities. Like, am I the most valuable person I can be to them? Am I bringing as much possible value to them uh, as they were looking for? Am I performing above their expectations? Um, all the way to the other side of things, of YouTube specifically, like, am I putting out as much content as I can? Am I as efficient in my business processes as I need to be in order to be providing as much value to my audience as possible? Um, and for the first two weeks of lockdown, I literally sat there, tore my business to the ground and rebuilt all the processes, mm -hmm. physically wrote them out, database them, stored them, started outsourcing things and, and resourcing other things into, you know, it's not resources, not the word. I started um, squeezing a lot of other things into buckets and piles of whatever could be done faster and more efficient and just revamped all my business processes. Because mm -hmm. to look at this situation and go, Woo's me, the world's falling apart and not look at the situation and go, how can I be better right now? Right. Um, would, would be me losing opportunity, yeah. um, I feel like. So uh, that goes all the way back to my experiences in football where if I get released, the, the 13 times I got cut and uh, released, every single time I looked at it and I was like, I probably should have blocked that guy on third and 18, you know, and uh, I missed this, sure. this assignment or whatever it might have been. That's probably why I got cut. You know, like there's always a moment or a situation where sure. you can say, how could I have been better than that? Um, and I'm looking at this and going, well, in eight months, I might not have a sponsor that I had for four years. Mm -hmm. And if, and if I'm not doing everything, you know, if I'm not looking at right now, how can I be better for them? I'm not doing justice to what I promised I would be doing or, or you know, and that's just, that's just how I kind of handle things. And that's what we talked yeah. about on the show. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was great. Cause you can always, you can always learn something, whether it's from a, you know, past mistake, like you said, or, or mm -hmm. sometimes you just beat yourself up, but you know, <laughs> it's always taking that opportunity to do the best you can with the situation you're in. And then you're just carrying that to whatever you're doing next. Yes. I think that's, that's something that whatever you go into, that's going to be uh, something that's going to serve anybody well. So for sure. Yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll wrap this up, but we've got just one more question. Any, any advice for someone, if you're talking to a uh, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 year old young man or young woman, um, and they really enjoy woodworking or working with their hands. And uh, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're not quite sure whether they should go to college or maybe pursue something more along these lines. What, what, what are some, some words of, of wisdom that you could impart to them? Um, I've given this piece of, advice, piece of advice a lot in the past. And I think, I think it still stands true as, as one is uh, don't be in a hurry. Mm -hmm. um, the, a, a lot of what happens in society today and a lot of what the external influences on our lives tell us is that everything is so fast when in reality, it's really, really not. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, if you could take that and apply it to anything in, in, in that question, um, if you're 14 or 15, you can't decide on college mm -hmm. uh, and whether you want to go and get, you know, continuing education in that way, or do you want to pretend to uh, pursue something with, with your hands or start your own business or something along those regards? Um, one, do not be in a hurry. Like take the time to sit down and map out the opportunity itself. Uh, mm -hmm. Consider as many options as possible. Yeah. And then, uh, make sure that you're putting happiness, um, at least in your top three priorities there. I tended to, for a long time, put uh, happiness on the back burner. Mm -hmm. um, and until I really started putting that at the forefront, nothing actually started to grow in my life, which was mm -hmm. super interesting because yeah. it makes it like, it's almost like counter, counterintuitive. But right. um, from my own experience, don't be in a hurry. Like I want to be the biggest, the best right now. I do. I truly do. But I understand that this is a process and that 
you have to work the process in order to get there and that it's a long journey. Um, right. you want to, you want to approach life as a long play. Like you want to become, you're either coming from sports, it's a cliche kind of phrasing, but, um, if you didn't get better today, you got worse. You never stayed the same. Um, right. so in that, in that regards is, is don't be in a hurry to be, you know, that goal of whomever you want to be, um, tomorrow put the steps in place to kind of get there. And, and also, uh, you know, because it's uh, younger people who are interested in working and, and doing things with their hands, like don't disregard the skilled trades. Like mm -hmm. there's a lot of statistics and data out there right now that there's going to be like millions of jobs yeah. uh, opening up in the skilled trades in the next three to eight years that are going to leave a lot. It's going to leave a massive gap in, um, in, in the workforce as far as, uh, you know, the, the sort of union jobs that are out there right now. Um, and, and it's because younger people like our, our, ourselves have not taken the initiative to uh, explore those opportunities. Uh, I, will, I will say this straight up, the, uh, you know, 60 to $80,000 a year that you can make out of two years of um, pipe, uh, pipeline welding school is a lot prettier for a lot more people than the $150,000 in debt you're going to get from a right. four year college. Right. Um, now, granted, if your if your pursuits and your in your passions in life, um, aren't leaning towards, you know, kind of being in the trades. Um, there's nothing wrong with that either. You know, I, I have a college degree. And I also happen to be someone who works with his hands. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no there's no harm in that um, in, in kind of taking your time to pursue both like, uh, and I'm 32 years, I'll be 32 here a month. And I'm little, I'm literally still trying to figure out what I'm doing almost every single day. Um, but what I do understand is that it's a constant work in progress. And that if I look at yesterday and I look at tomorrow, um, what am I doing right now to make sure that that I'm constantly going up the ladder and walking right. towards the path that I want to be on. Um, so don't be in a hurry. And then when it comes to specifically college or not college, definitely take into consideration getting into the skilled trades because there's, there's just so much upside and opportunity there. And I know a lot of people that make a lot of money yep. that went to school to be a carpenter or a plumber um, yep. and own the whole, own the whole thing now. Yep. Yeah. It's crazy. It's great. Yeah. It's absolutely insane. And speaking of someone that's in Minnesota is, uh, is, is Stanley the dirt monkey. If you're not familiar. Okay. No, I, um, I have not heard of Stanley. The check dirt. out Stanley. He is, he owns a massive landscaping company uh, up there near you guys. And yeah. they don't get the landscape very often. I don't think because it snows almost the whole year for you guys. No, but he is a, Phenomenal influence has worked with incredibly large brands uh, as far as like uh, power machinery. Right. Um, he's been on, he's been in ads for like 3M. Really? Met the guy in person a bunch of times. He has a class that he teaches on how to grow uh, uh, some sort of uh, his, uh, how to grow a landscaping company or is sort yeah. of like a hands-on program. I mean, phenomenal person, literally in the same area as okay. you guys. Um, and a great example of how you can put like your mindset and your hands to, to making a great life and career for yourself. Um, and you don't have to, you know, be in a hurry to do so. You can, right. you can work on it um, and, and you can get to where you want to be. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting a lot. You know, if, if you're a landscaper, typically you are, you know, you've got a big season in October for about a month where you're just charging, depending on the, on the size of the property, you know, 300 to 3000 yeah. current clearing leaves. And then the winter you're you now you are the, uh, Plowing snow. Well, plowing snow, and then it's just, it's all seasonal. So, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, he, his, uh, his Instagram's awesome. He's always talking about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, uh, I remember, I remember last year, you guys uh, in Minnesota got hammered. Oh, yeah. In April, late April, with like two feet of snow out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And he, and he was talking on his, on his Instagram about how he doesn't, um, he doesn't winterize any of his machines until the second week of May because, mm -hmm. You know, he's yeah. uh, historically over time, yeah. there's been that one storm in April yeah. that has crippled other businesses because they all packed up mm -hmm. and he was able to pick up two, three, four times the work because oh, yeah. his machines were available uh, and just little stuff like that. So he's a great guy, um, great sort of, uh, I, I guess, uh, example of that type of situation and super tangible to where you guys are at. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, you spending time with us and uh, taking the time. Um, yeah. Last thing, where, where can we find out more about you? Where's the best place to go? Uh, best place to go. Uh, well, if you want to, if you want to talk to me personally, hit me up on Instagram. That's uh, at John underscore Malecki 
Um, or, and if you want to watch me make some, make some stuff and be weird and crazy, uh, my YouTube channel's the same. It's, it's John Malecki built. Um, and, and those are probably gonna be your best two places. I've also got a website and I mean, if there's anything deeper, you can figure out a way to contact me there. If you've got any more questions, yeah. I will say this. If, uh, if you do have questions and you haven't listened to made for profit, the first thing that I will tell you is to go listen to made for profit. Um, as you're going to get a ton, there's just so many more resources out there. I mean, we're 126 episodes now, um, uh, talking everything from business in the shop, um, from top end finding new clients to how to get started building your business, to mm -hmm. managing your financials, to, um, you know, growing a YouTube channel, all that kind of stuff's on there. Uh, and if you're interested, you can find that at madeforprofit.com or on any podcast player, yeah. uh, Spotify, Apple, whatever is out there for Android kind of stuff too. Yeah. And I second that it's, it's been a huge, uh, inspiration and a lot of great, a lot of great content, a lot of great, great information on, uh, on that. So yeah. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you guys. Appreciate it.